Sarah Elton uh, Griffiths and Fred Amelie are going to discuss uh, the uh, nuclear issues and the Iran and American relationship. Uh, let's watch together what they have to say. Uh, it's now a privilege to, uh, to introduce three gentlemen. I would first like to introduce uh, Mr. Rick Reed. Uh, Rick Reed, simply put, is, uh, is host of the, the best public affairs show in California. That is uh, SoCal Insider on, uh, on PBS. Oh, is it so So please welcome Rick Reed to the stage. Next, another man who really needs no introduction, Mr. Fred Amiri. Uh, Fred Amiri has served as an official in various local and state positions. He served uh, with the administrations of four California governors. He is a former chairman of our council and a member of the Central Committee of the County's Republican Party. And uh, our last but not least, of course, uh, Sir Elvin Griffiths, a former member of the British Parliament, Chairman of its British Iranian group and one time Under Secretary of State in the UK government. Previously, he was a correspondent and editor of Time Magazine, Chief European Correspondent and Managing Editor of Newsweek International, and a columnist in US and UK newspapers. Having traveled on numerous occasions to all parts of Iran, uh, interviewed the Shah and senior members of the Islamic regime, his snapshots of Iran during the evolution of U.S. policy under three Democratic and two Republican presidents are vivid, penetrating, and often humorous. As Barack Obama now seeks to find a solution to the impasse over the regime's threats to Israel and reach for nuclear power, Sir Eldon's suggestions are as radical as they are realistic, contentious, bold, and timely. Please welcome Sir Eldon Griffiths. Distinguished guests, um, when Fred and Mary first told me to volunteer to come here tonight, he said that I should say just a few words, but I've never quite known what a few words really means. I, I did get some definition of that phrase the other day when I was uh, speaking of a Saturday night in the great state of Georgia. And uh, there was a knocking on the door, and there were admitted a young man, and uh, what in those parts is known as a Georgia peach. And they asked the uh, judge, who was my host, if he would marry them. And the judge said that even in the great state of Georgia, there were one or two rules about this kind of thing, and they'd have to wait until Monday. At which point the uh, young man's face fell and the Georgia peach burst into tears until suddenly inspiration came to her. And she said to the judge, my host, but sir, couldn't you say just a few words to get us over the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, I don't know whether my words will be few, <laughs> but they've got to start off with the fact that we've always tried in the World Affairs Council to keep our uh, events topical. And this one could not be more topical. The President, uh, in his State of the Union message, uh, mentioned the, uh, the challenge of Iran. The hearings of Chuck Hagel, not very edifying in my opinion, have turned very much on what he may or may not have said at some stage about Iran. But if you think that's undignified, consider this. The president of Iran, Emile Nejad, recently was in uh, Egypt, and on his return home he discovered that the speaker of the Majlis, the, uh, the parliament, had fired one of his ministers, one of his cabinet ministers. An immediate judge response was to go down to the uh, parliament building and set up a video and show the speaker, Mr. Lauren County, 
and his brother touting for business corruptly from a local firm. And the speaker of the Majlis said, you can't do that. And I mean, that judge said, I sure can. And then the following day, when the speaker went back to his district, which is the holy city of Calm, he was pelted with uh, stones and what in Iran and much of the Arab world is the greatest insult. He was pelted with shoes. You may recall that George Bush ran into some shoes after the Iraq war. Well, Naranjani, the speaker, who could be uh, a competitor for the uh, job of president in the Iranian uh, government, was pretty horrified by this. But it gives me at least a timeline. I want to start off with shoes. Because one of my many bosses, Margaret Thatcher, once told me that the only way to get into the mind of an enemy before you got involved in any kind of hostilities was to actually stand in his shoes, your enemy's shoes, and walk for at least a mile. And uh, I said, well, that's very interesting. Uh, how does it work? And she said, well, uh, then when the bullets start to fly, you're a mile, a mile away from all the fighting, and you've also got a new pair of shoes. <laughs> well, the shoes to me are a way into uh, my purpose tonight, which is simply to shine a light, if I can, onto the present uh, situation, the conflict between the United States and its allies, and the Islamic um, Republic. Some basics. First, Iran is big. You put one end on Seattle, the other end would come out just below Atlanta. It would fill about two-thirds of the United States. Secondly, it's potentially rich. It's got more gas than Saudi Arabia, a great deal of oil, probably second or third in the world, but it's also got a vast range of minerals copper, uh, chromium, iron, all of that, though they're difficult to get out. Above all, it's got what I think is its greatest asset, which is its people. And I've spent a long time with the uh, Iranian people, and I'd just like to quote some uh, words that I ventured to say about them uh, in my little book. And that is that uh, they are moon-faced, Hatchet faced, they are uh, angular, some dark, some fair complexions, but they do not fit the caricature of Persian rug dealers or morose looking bullets, which is what television would ask us to accept. On the contrary, and I'm quoting my own book, the Iranians haggle, gossip, Exaggerate, argue, dance, eat, gamble, sing, drink, and make merry. As a species, despite the mullahs, they're as warm hearted, as hospitable, as impulsive, as generous, as quarrelsome, and as sexy as any people on earth. And that's why I'm so glad to see so many of them here tonight. The issue, of course, is the uh, nuclear weapon. Is Iran uh, building uh, its nuclear assets in order to create an atomic bomb that could be used, notably as its president once threatened, to uh, wipe off uh, the Zionist uh, Israelis from the map of the Middle East? Is that their purpose? And are they doing it? Or alternatively, as the Iranians themselves say, are they doing it for peaceful purposes? Just a bit of history. It all goes back to atoms for peace. When we exploded the first hydrogen bomb at Bikini, by the way, that's where the, uh, the, the swimming suit Bikini comes from, I was a correspondent. I wasn't down there in the uh, island when it took off. But when that first hydrogen bomb went off, Many of us thought that the world would not last much longer. President Eisenhower then came forward with his atoms for peace. 
And it was the proposal that this uh, enormous source of new energy could be used for peaceful purposes. There were five nuclear powers, the United States, Russia, Britain, France, China. They could keep their nuclear weapons, but they were obliged by the agreement to reduce them. And although we've been slow, to some extent we have. But the second part of the agreement, which was called the Non-Proliferation Agreement, the NPT, was that we would assist all other powers that wanted to use the atom for peaceful purposes to do so. And that's how we brought into uh, being the Atomic uh, Energy Inspection thing, IAEA. Now, as the years have gone by, Iran was the first to sign outside of the five main nuclear powers. The first to sign, it was in London, it was signed by my friend Arish Zahedi. And uh, we assisted Iran in building its first nuclear plants. The one at Bashir, which you see in many of the uh, things, was actually constructed originally by Fluor Corporation and by Bechtel of San Francisco. And by the way, they made two billion in profit out of that. But then came two things that the film uh, shared with us. One was the sacking of the United States Embassy and the seizure of the hostages who were held captive for 444 days, led by my friend Bruce Langan, who has written the foreword to our book. And uh, Argo, I suppose, gave some flavor of that the other day. That was the first thing. And it, of course, created between the United States and Iran a most terrible conflict, made worse by the fact that Jimmy Carter, despite what he said, tried to rescue the hostages, and it was a failure. You remember the uh, ghastly business when uh, the American helicopters went down, the uh, refueling uh, uh, plane burst into flames, and we brought back uh, the charred bodies of many young Americans from the Delta Force and a number of Iranians as well. I was involved in that because the corpses were brought through my constituency in England. That was the first thing, a terrible embarrassment and a shocking uh, example of the Iranians ignoring diplomatic protocol. And the second thing, of course, was the Iran-Iraq war. Saddam Hussein invaded Iran, took advantage of the fact that the Ayatollahs had uh, executed many of the generals in the Shah's army, and he thought the opportunity was there for Iraq to take over the oil fields and the straits that uh, admit navigation into uh, uh, Iraq and Iran. It was uh, a terrible war. We looked the other way. Nearly 900,000 young men died in that war. More than half were Iranians. I was there part of the time. I was amazed by the way in which these young Iranian kids would hold a blanket round them so that when they charged into the tanks and the uh, minefields of Saddam's army, their body parts, instead of blowing all over the way, would be held together. And in that way, they thought they would go to paradise. And they had little plastic rings around their neck, little rings from Korea, which were to open the gates of paradise because they had perished in the fighting for their country. It was a ghastly time. It's sad to say that we, the United States, to some extent the Brits, helped the Iraqis. We helped them with intelligence, we helped them with uh, weapons. One aspect of uh, that was that uh, Colonel Rumsfeld, who later was to become the Secretary of Defense, went to Iran, organized the, uh, to Iraq, and organized some of the help that we provided to the Iraqis in that war against Iran. Fast forward. The Iranians, under the new Ayatollah, believed that nuclear power was satanic. And though they had started under the Shah, we helped them. The Ayatollah denounced it as the work of the devil, and the Iranian nuclear power station at Bushir was closed down. Instead of five and a half thousand technicians there, it was reduced to care and maintenance with something like 600. 
and I visited it. You could buy a picture postcard. Well now, the Iranian casualties in the war and uh, the uh, destruction that uh, they had seen of their electricity system led the Ayatollahs to restore the nuclear program at Bashir. And since that time, we've had the problem. To what extent are the Iranians now building uh, uh, their nuclear program to create weapons that could be used against the rest of the Gulf, particularly Israel, and at some stage, if they could put them into a long-range rocket, to be used against uh, Europe and the United States? I don't know all the answers, but I think I know some. But first, I'd just like to tick off the three options that uh, the United States and, uh, to some extent, the UK have been considering. One is a military attack. Do we have the means to destroy the installations around uh, Iran that you will see in your program? We know where they are. We know roughly what they're doing. Perhaps we could destroy them. Unfortunately, the, the best military advice is that the costs would be higher than the gains. Part of the cost would be, of course, to the United States and other air forces. The Iranians have spent a long time putting up some of the most sophisticated defenses in the world, and we would have heavy, heavy losses. The second is the collateral damage. Many of those installations are near large cities, and there's no question if we went after them with the large-scale bombing that would be required, that the number of civilian casualties would be enormous and that would create a cost for us to pay on an international scale. And the third thing, of course, is that the Iranians would retaliate. They'd certainly retaliate in the case of the Gulf of Hormuz. That's the narrow straits between the Persian Gulf, as it's called, and the Indian Ocean. I've been through those straits several times. They're about 40 miles wide. The United States Navy would, I think, be able to keep them open, though the Iranians have a large number of small gunboats. But the biggest danger, of course, is that they could take one of their super tankers, fill it with concrete and uh, various other forms of uh, explosives, and sink it in one of the channels. We've had that problem before in the Thames in the Second World War, and we still haven't got the thing out of the way. We had it when the first Queen Elizabeth was taken out to Hong Kong and sunk outside Hong Kong in the shipping channels. And it took a very, very long time to remove it. So there is that risk to the Straits of Hormuz. The second approach, of course, is economic. Can we squeeze Iran by the sanctions in such a way that uh, the regime will have to give in? Our sanctions are having some effect. There's no doubt that the standard of living, perhaps the quality of life in Iran, has been damaged seriously. And the hope is that that would bring pressure against the regime to come to terms with the West. I don't believe that's going to happen. My own experience is uh, partly in uh, Cuba, where no country has been subjected to US sanctions for so long, or so harshly as Cuba but it has not brought down the Castro regime. To some extent, it strengthened it because they've been able to blame the United States for everything that goes wrong. And I think the same thing already is happening in Iran. The third and more hopeful thing for me is, of course, the diplomatic and political approach. In the end, it is the people of Iran themselves who will change their regime. And there are signs, of course, that they're already very unhappy. It's important to remember that the Iranians were not natural converts to the Islamic version that the Ayatollahs brought. Their history goes back to the Zoroastria, and the Persians are not the same as the, as the Arabs. They're different. And so it doesn't follow that there's a huge religious backing there. Some, but not a lot. So I think uh, if we avoid the military attack, which might not work, if we ease up a little bit on the sanctions, because they're not going to be effective, we may be able to get into some kind of dialogue 
which will enable the Iranians themselves to change their regime, as Frank Sinatra used to say, to do it their way, not our way, to do it their way. So I conclude with some exact suggestions that we have put forward in this book. And I'm glad to say that uh, through uh, Ed Royce and the new uh, Secretary of State, uh, John Kerry, and through some of my friends in London, our suggestions are seriously being considered by the Saudis in the Gulf, by the UK, and uh, soon I heard the United States government. Proposal number one, the Gulf should become a security-free zone. This was suggested, actually, by James Baker after the first Iranian war, Iraq war. That is to say, all of the little states of the Gulf, from Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Sharjah, the rest of them, and Saudi Arabia, would agree to a non-aggression pact, whereby each would undertake never to attack the other, and also to go to the aid of any of the others that is attacked from the outside. And that, I think, would bring for the small Gulf states a great relief from the threat of Iran. And ultimately, we would ask Iran to join. In NATO, we ask the Germans to join, and they become great members, even though originally the pact was set up to prevent the Germans ever again attacking the rest. So point one is a security zone in the Gulf with undertakings for free navigation through the Straits of Hormuz. The second thing is to make it nuclear free. And this too goes back to proposals that were made from the United States and others many years ago. There would have to be a nuclear free zone which would mean that the United States removed and the British removed their uh, nuclear capable warships from the Gulf and also from the island of Diego Marcia, which is where we're based in the Indian Ocean. In return for that, we need absolutely irreducible safeguards against a nuclear weapon in Iran. I think that can be achieved because the weaponizing process is very, very much more difficult than has been acknowledged. And the third and last thing, but the important thing, is once you have a security zone and a nuclear free zone in the Gulf, it's got to be extended across the rest of the Middle East, and that has to include Israel. I've spent, as many of you have, a good deal of time in Israel. My daughter worked on a kibbutz. We know it well. Israel has uh, something like 200 free fall nuclear weapons. They're not missiles, they're free fall. But they're getting to be a little bit out of date, and they need to be modernized. And there's only one place they can be modernized, and that is the United States. The United States could, conceivably, provide the technology and the funds, because this is very expensive for the modernization of the Israeli uh, nuclear weapons. I doubt if we will do that. I think we should be more concerned to see if there's a diplomatic deal that can be achieved. Mr. Netanyahu doesn't agree with us, but uh, he, of course, did not do terribly well in his last election. And I think he's going to have to follow the United States and not lead it. And so our final proposal is that there should be a, an exchange negotiated over time that will have the Israelis reduce and eventually cold store and possibly in the end get rid of their nuclear weapons in return for there being an absolute guarantee of no Iranian nuclear weapons. And so I want to end with some words from the book that Fred and I put together. It is inconceivable that five million Israelis living in the midst of hundreds of millions of Arabs and Iranians can retain a monopoly of nuclear weapons in the turbulent Middle East. Within 20 years, the populations of the Arab and Iranian countries will be 30 times that of Israel, and their economic power at least six times greater. In those circumstances, there are some people in Israel 
to recognize that their greatest safety would come, as in nature, not from their own nuclear weapons, but from a deal that is guaranteed by the strongest military power on Earth, and that is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. We're already in Afghanistan, all the NATO countries, particularly the Brits and above all the Americans, we're withdrawing, but nevertheless, NATO hasn't extended that far. I think it is possible that NATO might accept a responsibility for the defense of Israel if it were to give up its nuclear weapons as part of a deal with Iran. This is big stuff, ladies and gentlemen, complicated. Read the book, but let me end with a little quote from the great Iranian poet, Rumi. And uh, I beg pardon, Hafez. And uh, Hafez wrote many, many years ago these words, and he was addressing the then uh, Shah and Shah. Thou art a bird of many storms. Wilt thou shrink from this one? And that's the question to Obama or his successors. We must not shrink from trying to achieve a settlement in the Middle East with Iran without, God forbid, a war. Thank you.